Welcome to Reloved Guitars, yet another guitar being set up. Uh, caution, if you've seen all of my setups before, you'll know everything I'm about to say. Although it has changed a bit over the years, but don't expect too much new, um, other than the guitar has changed a little bit and my technique has changed a bit over the years, but mainly about six years ago it changed um, and then it's stayed the same and it got a little bit more refined as we go. So what we've got here is a Harley Benton from the uh, stable of Toman out there in Germany. Obviously these are made probably in Vietnam, I can't remember, China or Vietnam. Um, and this is their, well this is an SC custom and this differs from uh, some of the single cuts SCs that I've had before in that it's first of all it's a little thinner let me sort of go and look at it sideways so it's got a kind of old-fashioned vintage guitar brand thickness old Epiphone old vintage sort of Korea Epiphone probably um, early vintage so it's it's about three four millimeters maybe three millimeters something like that thinner than uh, kind of modern vintage V100s and the other SCs, by the way. Um, you've also probably noticed there that it's got belly carve as well. And over on this side, you see a nice big belly carve and also uh, a lovely kind of carved neck joint with an access cut out there um, to make things as good and comfy as possible. Um, uh, kind of a couple of little blemishes to just point out which really are minor, but you can probably see there, he says stabilizing as much as possible. You can see the uh, the finish there doesn't quite go all the way or it's gone into a little void or cavity. And you can see that obviously there's quite a bit of um, the original scratching file marks on the end of the frets, um, which actually, if I zoom out again, don't feel uh, unduly sharp so you know it's just a detail we come up this end and we we do have a sort of grim looking nut that could do with certainly do with changing and it's sitting on a its own little shim there um, which kind of implies that it's, it's going to be fairly precise here which it's not bad actually so somebody with the the original material has probably you know had a go at getting that to work as well as possible but you can see that Andy's had to you know load it up with some graphite to make it work the way you really want it to and uh, so I'm going to replace that with one of my adjustable tusk custom nuts and because in a way that's just perfectly what this guitar well that suits this kind of guitar perfectly so we've got uh, a sort of fake rosewood here where I don't know what they call this some some people it's not the it's not the um, Vietnamese rosewood stuff or variant but it's a uh, it could even be a sort of dyed color thing I don't know but you know it's not bad at least it doesn't have that sort of gray sandy gunpowder corduroy look that um, some guitars had coming out of China for the last couple of years or last few years to I'm presuming to get over the sites restrictions on rosewood at the time We've got two Roswell uh, humbuckers, zebra humbuckers. We've got a standard issue Harley Benton or Toman Harley Benton tunematic bridge um, stop bar. And we've got three controls, which is quite nice. And the last one being a push pull. Um, and we've got sort of uh, uh, shallow strap lock type fittings on the back there. Again, I don't know if those are standard or they're upgrades on this model. We got sort of coffin shaped um, cut out there and they call it a custom line. It is made in Vietnam, there you go. Um, yeah, and yeah, custom line and Grover. Uh, honestly, whether they're Grovers or not, hmm, it's really hard to say. The other thing about this one, unless I'm completely mad, this is distinguished by having this volute here, which um, I don't think any, well, not the SCs I've seen before uh, have, have all had um, scarf joints. Um, so this is sort of a nod to a traditional, I guess a traditional Gibson style improvement. Um, so, and there you have it. It's in a nice satin finish. 
and uh, it is a beautiful thing and it deserves to play it really well. So I'm going to just start off by um, doing the normal thing, which is just have a go at the frets and see how they play at the sort of action that I would like. Obviously, I'm going to try and keep this zoomed where I can get the best view. Um, I will bring the camera down this end when the when I'm doing the nut. He said about to do the nut. So um, I think it's pretty low at the moment, but I'm also pretty sure that Andy said that it was uh, it was kind of um, difficult to play. It wouldn't stay in tune and it was fighting him. So I wouldn't be surprised if I find some buzzing frets and choking frets as well. Um, if I just start off by having a look at the action down here. As I say, it is pretty low, so we've got, here I've got about 1.75 and actually two. 1.75 and two, I'll just note, make a note of that. That's, that's you know, higher than it ought to be, so one point seven five and two which is the opposite way round so the high e is two the low e is 1.75 and really i'd be aiming for 1.2 and 1.5 so we want about 0.8 of a millimeter off the high e so um to get that i'm just going to do the obvious thing and that is to dial this in and uh, down a bit on both sides but more on the treble side and then just measure it again to where we want Okay, that's a bit too much on the bass side, and that's nearly right on the treble. And these are quite fairly stiff, so you have to be careful. Um, okay, just over 1.5, 1.5 in a bit, in a tiny fraction. Okay, so that's our start point. Ooh, let's have a, an E. So the first thing I think it's worth demonstrating, and, and this is the first thing that will catch any, any musician out of the box. Straight out of the box. Um, you'll probably find that it's going to go out of tune if you bend notes. So let's try all the individual notes playing. Okay, 13th fret. Yeah, whatever that is, 18th. Thirteenth is a little bit high, and the eighteenth. Not bad. bad at all really there's a couple of um really it's a 12th and 13th fret a little bit high maybe 18th up here a little bit on the treble side but actually it's a it's a pretty good start point um quite pleasantly surprised um you know maybe shouldn't be surprised because toman's getting better at what they do um you know seems to have been improving over the years i reckon anyway from the ones i've seen particularly the fret work um the fret levelness so what I didn't check, by the way, was the relief. So let's have a quick eyeball of that. Um, okay, that's about 0.2, which isn't bad, 0.25. I would leave it there to begin with. I'm not going to worry too much about the height of these um, strings, uh, height of the, uh, the first fret, because we're going to remove that and that anyway. Um, so the first, the first thing is we've checked all the frets uh, and they mostly play um, what I haven't checked now is some bends on the high E, and this is often where you find 
really low action can struggle. Not bad. Well, that's not bad. Um, nothing choking out on those bends and they're tens, I think. So that's, um, I'm not that, that good at bending them that hard with my weak little fingers. Let's just double check that for a minute. I'm pretty sure there'll be tens, yeah, 46s. Um, so yeah, really good start. Now what you'll find is the next thing that happens, let's do a little bit of bending, um, stretching, I should say. Um, and see where we go. Because this is a standard problem anyway, and it's not particularly, sub, it's not you know, defined or re re reserved, con confined <laughs> to any particular guitar. It's a standard problem. The still some slack in my strings or in the string train. Yeah, horrible. Um, and that will keep on letting itself eke out over um, you know, a couple of years if you don't physically take it out. So when we come to put new strings on here, I'm gonna make sure that we stretch that out as long as it takes to stop any detuning as we get it, um, uh, as, we, as we stretch it. Good. Well, this is this is going to be leveling um, for the sake of precision and to just e e even out that slight deadness on the 12th, 13th frets and a bit on the 18th. But it's really minor. So, you know, hats off to Toman on this. Um, we're going to make it the best it can be. Um, and so we're going to go in at this low action. We're going to replace the nut. Now, let me find, first of all, my various bits and pieces. Now where's my new my new drawer full of bits? Oh yeah, 3D nut bases and oh we've got feet as well. We don't want feet, we want 3D nut base. Da -da. The lowest one and we want an adjustable nut. We got one up on the wall sitting there. Okay, so here we have waiting the uh, tusk adjustable nut and its little hex key. Um, now I've been incredibly lucky that a very good hearted person called Gerard has co contacted me a, a couple of months ago and said, I can see you go to great lengths to, uh, to make these, make your adjustable custom adjustable tusk nuts. And he said, you know, I, I'm kind of keen on 3D printing. I think I could probably make you some bases that would do the job for you. And so, bless him, he put in loads of hard work and time and effort and indeed made me uh, a whole load of custom bases for these custom nuts. And I've got to say that it's an absolute boon to have that because it saves me quite a lot of time in the hand making uh, and using resins to make up those parts myself. Now, you know, the, the thing is people, you know, you might kind of, you might think, God, you've actually spent all that time making those and then hand shaping them and hand filing them down to size. Well, the, the answer for that is yes, because having the adjustable nut is the most important thing of all. Having a, uh, an action that you can set whilst using a, um, a tusk nut that doesn't, um, that doesn't, um, you don't have to cut into the slots. It's just an absolute, uh, boon for your guitar for staying in tune and so as a result uh, I would go to whatever lengths it, it required to make it. Now here I have been here before and I'm going to just tap this nut and just start it moving. Now I did this another time not so long ago and the damn thing took off half of the headstock with it um, which was <sighs> yeah well deeply distressing but in this case I'm just going to be um, encouraging it to come off of its own free will. You know, you, if you're, if it's necessary, you can um, 
you know you can saw the nut off and uh, get it to come out um, in halves if you like um, but it, it can be a major deal with a hacksaw going on for quite some time so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a very fine point of some kind and I'm just going to use the fact that it's got a little shim in here just to uh, help prise it out because I want it to come out I could do with a, a little starter hole which I could drill in there um, actually no I'll tell you what why don't I just use a pair of grippers fret puller pliers which are quite good for lifting things out um, yeah so so you know I guess my my start point would have been however hard the job is I'm going to make sure that I um, I'm going to make sure that I get an adjustable nut whatever it however it however hard it's going to be to do it um, because that means that I'm going to get the best possible action now this is um, this is being a little bit stubborn it just needs a bit more wiggling in its slot and the thing is when you have the nut fitted very precisely if it's not a good nut you still want it out no matter how well it's fitted um, and you can't really get too much purchase on too much uh, down here to get it out like that and what you'll find is because of the amount of glue they've used that happens you can't really cut that without making more cracks so it's a uh, it's okay it's it's um, touch upable um, but it's just the way it goes that's a, a lot of glue that makes that happen um, but having said that they the, pl the plus the pros of having this adjustable nut there oh I should have come down this end the pros of the adjustable nut far outweigh small issues like that let me just put one out over there let me get a mirror right I mean the chances are I'll be able to get that little piece of flake of paint off there and, and stick it back in place um, that's usually what happens but that's that's the idea you can see that this is going to sit on there I'm just going to sand that very carefully flush it is almost flush we're going to get it sit beautifully in place um, and that's going to be see most of that's covered up so it's a little tiny bit that we've got to replace back in here so I shall do that this is actually so good that it's almost placeable right as it is and I think in terms of the action if we just place this on here I think we may have the tiniest bit of actually you know what we don't even need to file down the underside this is ready to go and that that really is the plus side of uh, what Gerard did for me is he's made we may need to there you go fit perfectly in place it, you know we may need to um we don't need to do anything, it's sitting on the first fret. Okay, I'm gonna do this little repair on the end here, so it's gonna take a while, so I'm gonna go off and see you in a minute when I've done that. Well, hello, welcome back. I'm slightly miffed with Harley Benton. This is the third string I've put on this guitar. These are supposed to be sacrificial strings, right, to begin with, and I just need them on to uh, basically do the fret leveling, but you know what's happening? Every single one I've put on is broken at the ball end. So it's cost me two packs of Harley Benton strings already. Now, fair play, they're only a quid, but it's just a waste of money. I mean, you know, if you can't stretch a string without it breaking at the ball coming unraveled. Now, unless there's something, the first one that was on here, which was also a Harley, ben, Harley Benton string, that broke. Um, and I put another one on, that broke straight away. So unless there's something wrong with the back end of this stop bar that's causing these to break, then it's a highly bent problem, a <laughs> string problem. But, so that's two sets of strings. Anyway, this one, I'm, I'm just reusing a heavier gauge that's so not technically. I'm gonna leave that about there. That's not entirely correct. Okay, so let's get on with it. Hello there. Uh, welcome to Wimble Wednesday. Wednesday it is. So I'm now going to 
um, mark up the frets here and get this ready for that leveling to take care of the very slightly high frets 12 and 14 and 18 12 10 10 14 and 18 I think anyway so so having spent more of yesterday's session most of yesterday's session repairing the uh, nut damage you know I'm, I'm sort of I'm, I'm cheesed off with these manufacturers uh, with I think the two things the things that bother me is that is the way that the uh, first of all yes they use crappy nuts to begin with why not put a tusk nut in leave it high if necessary but let us cut it down that wouldn't be so bad all right it would be a bit more expensive but you know just give us a chance but no they fit a cheap trashy plastic hollow nut right which you have to remove if you want to upgrade and so on top of that then they also fit it with so much glue that it's almost certain to tear some of the wood that's that's in a sense that's the smaller of the two the lesser of the two evils because what's worse is that they put the nut on first and then they paint the guitar and the finish on the headstock goes right up to and up the sides of the nut and as a result of that it basically glues the nut all the way along the front edge of the headstock finish uh, and to be honest once that's happened you haven't got a very good chance of removing the nut without something bad happening no matter what you do um, been in this situation loads of times and just by bad sheer bad luck the last couple of times uh, in taking the nut off the headstock material has chipped but it's chipped for exactly the same two reasons and that is because the the whole sort of carpet of uh, finish goes right up and over the nut base um, and so although I got it moving I you know, tapped it and got it moving the problem is you can't get it off that it's like that it's, it's up the side up the edge of the nut you can't get it off there because it's glued to it by by the finish if you try and cut it with a blade you'll crack it it'll break anyway um, if you try and snap it off it'll take whatever it wants to take off with it so you really you're only you've got to just do the best you can to get it off and unfortunately it's going to cause some um, splitting there's nothing you can do about it and I, that just cheeses me off um, it, you know because it's, it's not great from the customer's point of view um, you know because I'm now having to correct something that I've done um, and it's it's also not great from time and effort point of view because you know it's going to take me hours longer to fix everything up than it should which is really annoying so i'm going to bring you down here for a sort of mm, standard <clears throat> mid shot of fret leveling okay let's get on and do it so i'm expecting to see here uh, high frets on 10 or uh, 10 12 and 18 i think something like that and these are pretty good all around i mean you know, I'm just I'm just taking it down a little bit more since that's what we're doing and uh, you know oh, there you go look. it's not actually it's not ah okay so it's not 10 that's low it so it's not 10 that's high it's nine that's low there we go that one there absolutely nothing touching it at all so that's you know and indeed 12 is high um, and we've got 18 is a little high as well so kind of as as expected let's just check that 10 because that was the one that was had a slightly dead sound around that point <clears throat> not bad actually I'll go with that so I'm up here a little bit earlier today. Um, I've got so many things to do. Uh, 
I'm going to finish this one today. Um, after that, I've got to, oh, I don't have to, but I'm going to do a little bit of finishing work on Ian's chessboard. It's been a long, uh, slow cooking, uh, yeah, 12, slow burning project. But now I'm getting towards the finish. So I've got a bit of sanding and chiseling to do. Uh, and then I've got to insert a Morris decal. It's good. Um, yeah, so I've got that to do. Then I've got the blue, L blue, strap L blue 2. Um, and that has, I've got to extend the P90 cable for the neck pickup, which is a, uh, it is called a bare knuckle supermassive. And it's a neck one. So uh, it's going to go in the neck, but I think the wires have grown a bit short over a couple of years I've had it. So I'm going to get that extended and we'll fit that in because that's going to go uh, oh, we can't I'm waiting for some p90 screws which are supposed to be here today but they'll be here about six o'clock or usual amazon sort of last delivery time and anyway so i don't have those just yet i might be able to make the holes and position it using uh, another set of screws not the ideal ones but anyway um, so we'll get that done and then I've got, oh yeah, I've got a couple of um, Trekkies to sort out. Well, I've got one to build from scratch, a commission, uh, and then I've got an older one to change the bridge on. So I've got two Chinese headless bridges. It's funny because I made a, a couple of guitars um, with a certain type of bridge, the sort of individual headless units, because they look pretty cool compared to the cruder one, the, the bridge that, that I, I started off using, which was a single unit, headless bridge unit. Um, and it's one of those things you sort of you know that you want to try something else out, but another part of you says, actually, I know already that I'm not going to get any better than I've got. Um, because the, one of the my most, um, my, my favorite guitars has exactly that bridge on it and it is the most stable guitar for tuning in the world it's it's actually very easy to tune but you don't need to tune it um hardly ever need to tune it it's so stable and so the payoff of that for me is worth the whole uh, snob value or lack of snob value you know where people say well it's a it's a cheap chinese pop metal bridge you know i've seen it on aliexpress well, yeah, you have, and so have I. And actually, I've not found anything yet that works anywhere near as well for the pound for pound price that you pay for it. You know, and basically it means I can make a commission that I know will play and stay in tune. And I can I can make it a, a price that's affordable compared to, I, I you know, literally would have to add 300 quid to the price if I put one of the, the more sexier, um, types of uh, bridges you know that the specialist headless people make um, which would be great in some ways you know there, there's nothing wrong with super sexy hardware but you know just chucking 300 quid onto the price and actually in terms of tuning stability i almost certain it wouldn't play any better um, so i'm very convinced about this unit i've, I've got it on a number of guitars. In fact, I've got it on two two keeper guitars of mine, which I absolutely love. One is a Trekkie, and one is a an Oak, Oak Caster design um, earlier shape. But I love both of those guitars, and I would I can happily just go and gig with those and play for three hours with a gap in between. And only in my experience is is only having to just look and tweak look at and tweak the tuning in between, it's that good. So, you know, it's a problem that doesn't need fixing, so I'm not going to fix it. I'm gonna go with it and use what I know works. So that means there's two guitars currently, actually three, two Trekkies, one exists, I'm going to change the bridge on, uh, and that's for a customer called Beach. The other one is a commission from scratch 
for beach using the same a new uh, and the same bridge as well. He's already got a, a Trekkie of mine, which he adores, hence wanting two more. So we, he's going to have a different a set of con different configurations, uh, pickup configurations. So, so yeah, I'm going to use up two of those headless bridges, and then I need another one because I'm going to replace the, the individual uh, units that I put on my Deacon Backer um, three two five tribute style fun fun tribute style guitar. Um, you know, and that was a that was another sort of situation where it was the period where I tried those out, and actually uh, I just I really couldn't get on with them. They just didn't do what I needed them to do. They were too hard to uh, tune, and actually they weren't even as as confidence inspiring or as stable as the ones I'd used before on older builds. So, unsurprisingly, um, I'm going backwards to the dependable equipment and I'm gonna basically go with that um, you know and it, you know it's been interesting because Beach has spoken to me a number of times about the Trekkie that he bought from me and uh, he absolutely loves it and he's got dozens of guitars of all brands top brands you name it rare guitars and so on and in a way it's become, uh, you know, as I hope when I make something, it's become his total favorite go-to guitar. Um, and in, in some ways, you know, you can't really even examine and explain why, and, and that really isn't the point. The point is, it's just something he, he it plays the best uh, of anything, and he keeps going back to it. And it, it'll also be because it stays in tune perfectly well as well. And there's no doubt about that. So. Um, anyway, yeah, it's, it, it's a real pleasing thing for me to have somebody who loves um, what I've made that much that they want two more of the uh, very similar. Of course, the challenge with that is because I, um, I make them from with or out of upcycling necks, um, each one is slightly different, although there, you know, there's some some com commonalities between them. But in terms of neck feel, each one's slightly different. Um, for example, one of the ones that Beach wants to buy, when I'm happy with the bridge setup on it, is uh, Trekkie number six, and that has a 24 fret uh, Ibanez neck, which suits what he wants. He needs 24 frets, so. You know that's obviously going to feel a little different, um, but for the 22 fret neck, I'm I'm hoping I'm trying to get something similar. So I had to go back and look through all my build notes and photo albums and stuff to find out what the neck was that I actually put on the guitar that he loves so much. So it was a bit of a, a kind of you know trip back through time, and it turned out it was the strap style neck that came on the. Wesley, a Wesley um, acrylic guitar that I bought, um, and actually when I when I played around with the body a little bit, I just thought it was so un, unwieldy and actually un, unappealing as a body. You know, um, it's just gimmick. There's no real, it had no um, no saving graces. It isn't what, no redeeming qualities, I suppose you'd say. So I, I ended up somewhere out the back there, and I think it's probably going to go in a bin sooner or later. But, um, you know, the neck that came with it was a perfectly good, um, relatively decent quality Stratocaster style neck. And Wesley were, are reasonably good quality guitars. They're, they're one of the, I think they're one of those brands um, made from a partnership with a, of a UK guitar enthusiast, uh, possibly a guitar maker, Luthier or whatever, uh, in conjunction with a Chinese manufacturer. Um, and actually with those guitars, uh, with those types of guitars or those brands, it seems that there are quite a lot of uh, failed partnerships out there. Um, and then the market gets, well, flooded isn't the right word, but they often get sold off uh, cut price. But during the time that they're produced, the quality is, is often very good because, you know, whatever realities that the parties found themselves in, um, you know, business is a hard 
margins game, um, you, you can be fairly confident that the, the person who sort of set it up is usually somebody who's very enthusiastic and keen on getting the quality of the, of the guitars that they're his brand, his or her brand on it, making sure that quality is right. Um, so, you know, there's a sort of good head start in quality there. So, so Wesley was one of those and, uh, you know, a lot of, I've had a few different Wesleys um, and they did seem to make a lot of these uh, acrylic, um, see-through acrylic ones, which I never, I only bought the one body, uh, well, one guitar and I didn't, really you know it just doesn't score in playability or it's not even practical it's just too heavy and you know the body is too sharp in its curves it just doesn't add anything to a strat and like i say it's only really only got in a novelty value which isn't enough of a reason really to spend time putting decent pickups into it and setting it up anyway so uh, i used the neck off that and so i've been kind of on the lookout now for similar um, Chinese style, strat style necks. Um, but the key thing about the Wesley one, uh, when I look at it, is it had some nice grain on it. So it was it was proper rosewood. None of this sites friendly, um, corduroy wood as I call it, the gray looking stuff. Um, it's, uh, you know, so I'm on the, I've been on the lookout for proper rosewood. And of course the place to get that is from older, uh, pre sites guitars and, and you know if you kind of have a good look around you can find obviously quite a lot of guitars like that um, not least things like uh, squires you know 2000s squares of the 2000s they tend to be very good quality and tend to often feature very nice rosewood fingerboards so um so i didn't find this well i did find some squires but they're a bit expensive and obviously paying a bit for the headstock. So I found this Yamaha neck, which would be a good start point. It's quite flat, like the Chinese um, Chinese Strat neck on the Wesley, but it's also got this nice um, wood. Now, whether that's actually rosewood or not is anyone's guess, but it's, it's more timber than this stuff um, and it's got a nice grain in it. So, you know, it would be an attractive thing, attractive neck to upcycle. So that's one, and I might keep on looking for a couple more. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is I've got the nut set to the right height, and Andy was um, keen to have the adjustable nut, but he wanted to be certain that the, uh, when it was set at the right height, that these grub screws were hidden, and they are clearly under the surface, which is great. So I'm gonna leave that as is. Now what I'm going to do next is I'm going to use my, I finally got hold of some officially low tack, um, masking tape and I'm going to trust this guitar to be capable of taking masking tape and I'm going to uh, cover it up to protect the fingerboard. So this is going to be sort of boring process of not only putting tape on like this but then cutting a whole series of strips to make the size work and uh, anyway what I'll end up doing is polishing out all of these frets to a shine. Um, I think I'll end up with a Dremel, um, yeah, Dremel polish as well. Uh, and then we'll, we'll be ready to put new strings on. It's gonna have new tens, um, only balls, or Daddario's, whichever I've got to hand. Um, and then it'll be a case of uh, setting it up or finishing the setup by intonating it and so on, um, and stretching out the strings. And so thankfully it won't have anything to do with Harley Benton strings, so we won't break any in the stretch out. Um, the only one part of the setup that's, as you probably remember from other setups, is undecided at this point and still potentially presents a bit of a problem and I perhaps should have tested it out before I got to this stage, but I didn't. And that's the intonation. So at the moment, I don't know whether this, uh, the saddles are in the correct positions on the, in the bridge. Sometimes when they 
put the bridge in slightly the wrong place. You have to, we, I have to uh, turn around some of the saddles. And I seem to remember this, uh, that bridge on that Harley Benton is quite difficult. The last time I tried to do it, the thing stripped or wouldn't, wouldn't work for some reason. I can't remember now, but it was problematic. But that's what we have to do to, to get the right intonation. And failing that, um, you know, it's, it's, if you can't get the bridge to work ideally, then there are plenty of options, such as uh, getting a replacement bridge. And, and typically I would spend 15 pounds and get a fairly decent, or 15 to 20 max, get a fairly decent roller bridge, um, which sort of treats the strings a bit kinder. For some reason, I've managed to slice through all this leftover masking tape, so it's actually not coming off easily. I've done some cutting on here that I shouldn't have done. Anyway, so what I'll do is um, save you the bottom. I'll do the polishing, sanding and polishing process of the camera. And then when I come back, I'll be ready to string with the new strings and we'll put some um, oil on the fretboard before we put the new strings on. Um, the, the one argument for testing the inter well, there's an argument for testing the intonation early with the old strings, and that is you probably get a heads up on whether it's going to be close or miles off when you come to put the new strings on. Um, and doing that means you don't have to stop, discover it's not intonating with the new strings, um, slack the new strings off and then set the intonation or change the saddles around and then come back and put the strings back on. And that, that way, on a downer, that would, um, you know, that would kind of strain, stress the strings a little bit more than I'd want to. You know, I'd like to, I like to put them on and have them stretch. That's it, ready to play. That's as much stress as I want them to have. Um, so that's the plus side of testing it out first, but the downside of testing it out first is that um, sometimes the new strings are different and intonate differently to the old ones. So if you go ahead and, and you know, check it with the old ones, it may not work out the same when you put the new ones on anyway. So it's not, it's not a guarantee uh, to stay with it. Anyway, save you the boredom. Let me, uh, let me just switch the cameras off and I will make myself a cup of tea and go into the old radio for extra mode, which is old comedy. Um, and then I will come back when we've done the aerobic fret polishing setup or procedure. Uh, just to show you where I'm at it, since this is live in the house. Oh, you can see behind me, by the way, this is going to be the base of, uh, of um, Beach's tricky, great big piece of well, a tabletop of 1850s um, mahogany, some of which I've used already in the edges of this chessboard. Um, and here it is now. I'm just doing sort of sanding. I've done, filled a couple of little holes here, which I'm going to sand out, a couple of little drilled, doweled bits. But beyond that, oh, and I've, I've made some um, little ecky bits in the corner to hold or to strengthen the joints. So basically it's a case of sanding now and after the sanding um, then I'm going to go into oiling which I'll, I'll take home to do the oiling and build up a nice um, true oil finish on this. Um, uh, but before I do the oiling I'll go, um, I'm going to sink a Morris into the uh, in, into a little recess, a Morris decal into the recess I think it's going to be a white one or a silver one, and he's going to sit in there, and then I'm going to put clear, um, clear resin on top, UV cured resin. Anyhow, let's stop this now, and I will see you shortly. Right, so uh, polishing out and everything is done. Before I go any further, I'm just taking a look at the uh, wiring here, um, because Andy was not too happy with the switch on that one so we've got to have a replacement switch up and down up and down now interestingly this is huh, I, yes I could get this wrong now couldn't I because I suppose we hope that that one goes to there in the down position 
that connects connects with the down connects with that one so in the down position right so up down right up is connects to the what's it so we're going to make a mark because it's too easy to get it 50 percent wrong which is wrong enough so this is neck there we are neck <laughs> and we're going to assume that that's the same game hmm. neck at the top could be wrong and we won't know until the final bit so i'm going to undo this now the problem we may have is we may not have enough room for such undoings, but let's hope we do. Put that over there, out of the way. Got a nice cracked finish all around the hole. probably don't have that much room um, so I think in this case I'm going to need to carefully undo all of this before I try and so typically what they do with less pulls is they fit that pull the wires tight and then wire it all up with no more room which means changing this is nigh on impossible um, because you don't have any spare wire can't pull it out do anything um, so we're going to go there to there and we're going to need a bit of extra wire possibly <laughs> don't really want to start pulling from there but so i'm going to need to undo this i don't want to lose any wire at all so i'm going to have to bring this can i do i have i no i haven't got I haven't um, thought about the soldering bit, so I haven't got anything set up over here for soldering. So, um, <coughs> I'm going to just sort of work my way around it. I should have had the bench clear, and no, I could have done it there. Okay. So you just hang on there, friends. <laughs> Uh, yes, so we will very carefully unhook all of those. Yeah, you can sort of see, and you can sort of see a bit wonky. And we'll get a pair of pliers. So this is also grounded. really should have one of those uh, soldering iron stations that I could just move over here instead of having screwed it very cleverly to the wall, which seemed to make sense at the time. Okay, so I have to now carefully remove each one of these. Oh, I'll tell you what I'll do is I'll, before I do anything, stay, I will mark this one as neck is one bridge is two that's what i think anyway and what i could do just to be sure what let's test it so i know, I know i've got them the right way around because it's a pain in the ass two different kinds of switches so let's just double check the uh, resistance of each of these if i can anything hello um this is coming off the volume pots to the what's it 
right 410 on that one and about the same that's helpful four nine four nine identical uh, well <clears throat> That don't help me none. So what shall I do? Shall I let's remove one? So I suppose what I can do is I can take me a little, do me a little test while I'm at it. Let's use a small lamp. Let's make sure I've got my assumptions right. I want to know which is my, which is which. So. Currently one is un undone. Currently one is undone. <coughs> okay, neck is undone. Good. It is as I thoughted. Neck is undone. So neck is one, one dot, bridge is two. Neck is one dot, but it's two, just so I don't lose track and get it 50% wrong, which is totally wrong. And I have been known to do such before. So in the middle, we have the output. Thank you. And we have the bridge. the main wires. Can we get this out? Not without stretching that somewhat. Do we have any stretch? Do you know what? I don't rightly think we do. It's a bit of a pain, I'm afraid. Now, they've done that absolutely infuriating thing of Putting it in, pulling it tight, and that's the lot. So I can't get this undone. Uh, I certainly won't be able to get it easily done up again. Let's try and see if I can remove the solder off here. It's a bit of a pain, I have to say. So there's a great big blob of wire here, a chunk of wire, so it's hard to get this to melt enough to come off. Your pliers are acting as a heat sink as well. Absolute pain. So this is this is a simple thing that isn't simple at all, courtesy of the the way it's wired. And now we have to try and see if there's any way of recuperating, regaining any wire. Uh, in order to get a bit more reach to be able to change this thing. Let's 
pretty, pretty tightly arranged. Yeah, what have we got here? We got red, grey, and green, grey and green, red, grey and green, and that looks like it's pretty tight. Oh, there's a bit of extra. Right. So first of all, I'm going to undo these. Look for the wire clips because they're not really helping. Let's see if it gives us a back a fraction of wire. And in order to get a fraction of movement out of this, we might. Uh, we can do a bit of a pull actually. We can. Green, come on, green. It's pulling through because the uh, pickups are uh, in the way. A bit of a pull. Okay, a bit more of a pull. Really. Thank you. Okay, that's what I needed. Now this is good for soldering things, but this one, for some reason, this one really doesn't like to put enough heat onto the component. Uh, see what I mean? It's just struggling to warm it up enough because it's attached to a large component. So the only way I'm going to successfully do that is to heat up the crudest of all, um, what do you call it, soldering irons, which I've got over here, and use that instead, which takes longer to heat up, but eventually gets there. That's in there, that's for there. that one as well. So I'll put that one over there like that and this one like this. Yeah. Okay, um, I'm going to switch off and put the radio back on. I'm going to leave this heat up. So this is a simple enough process. I know which side is which. I'm going to have the neck on that side, bridge on the bottom, output in the middle. I have to strip back a little bit of wire here, so I may pull some through. I could just cut this off as a lump, um, which might be, and ultimately might be a better thing to do, but I do sort of want to get it through a little gap here, so it'd be nice if it came off as a, a thinner piece anyway. And I'll also do it when I'm heating up with the, the uh, what to call it, that horrible thing, draper solving on it, I'll just, have that there as a, a bib. Anyway, um, I'm going to do that and then I'll come back when it's restring time. Right, back again. So that was a, a lot of um, a diversion, shall we say. Um, we've got the new thing fitted, thing switch, through, switch fitted, so that's good. Um, works fine and it is a bit stiffer than the original, so that will solve that problem. So I think um, Andy will notice an improvement. But like all things, nothing was simple. In other words, this replacement, the sort of quality switch, uh, is a shorter shaft than the, uh, the cheaper one that it's replacing. And of course, that isn't long enough to go through the hole. So I had to drill a little bit deeper to counter sink it, uh, if you like, so we could just get through as much as it needed to fit in, um, which is a sort of scary thing to do, but it's all done and everything's working. The other thing is this switch, um, switch, yes, this thing wants to uh, touch out on the um, the edge where it's in. There's a risk of it touching out, so I've put some tape on the inside. Again, not not a problem you get with this model where the contacts are up on the top. So just little little things that you you kind of don't realise until you go to upgrade. 
and then you find that upgrading is a lot harder than you expected. But thankfully, um, you know, it would have been a shame to go backwards after all of that messing about and um, go back to the original one, which, you know, I know that Andy was particular about not liking the way that switch felt. So to go back to the original and say, well, I can't, I'm afraid I can't do anything with it because, um, <laughs> because it's, uh, you know, it's a non, uh, non-conventional, it's an unconventional um, setup. Therefore, we can't change it out, um, would be a disappointment. So here we have it, Ta -da, nice stiff new switch. Lovely. Okay, so I'm going to quickly move these things out of the way, put that back on there, put that back on there. I'm just going to wash my hands very quickly and then we'll get some new strings. Oh, we'll, we'll oil the board and then we'll get some new strings out. Once I've done this guitar, my next main task tonight is going to be tidying up because I've got my old mate Malcolm coming over tomorrow and uh, um, yeah, I don't think he's come up here before, so it's a bit bad that it's um it's untidy. Now what have we got? We got tens, okay, the Dario tens. But before we put those on, let's get the oil on the fretboard. Okay. Um, Okie dokie. Oh, now what do, let me just check with these tuners, make sure I've got them tightened up. Because I only just, no, I didn't. See, I only just put them back on to tighten them up. That's good. Done. Ah, right. Oil time. String time. Stretch time. There's, I keep losing little things. It's not surprising, given it's such a mess, but I keep losing little things. So, for example, I've lost my really nice quality countersink which has really annoyed me um, and I have lost what else have I lost oh yeah I've lost the little Dremel clutch sort of spanner thing <coughs> which again it's probably just around somewhere but I don't, you know kind of having to clear everything up so I'm gonna spend some time tidying this evening um, Next guitar on the Andy list is the Epiphone Broadway, which is that lovely semi-acoustic beastie, which would be nice to um, nice to have a play on. So with that, I'm going to be uh, going to be changing the bridge over, picking a, a, tun a tunematic bridge instead of the um, the wooden one. But I'm going to also need to modify the existing footing that the bridge stands on because it's uh, it's it's sort of now all too high. Now let me just uh, let me just put these bits spare bits away in here. You can go back with this guitar. Right. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to zoom in on the uh, the business end. So what I'm going to do is just show you my stringing technique. Everyone has their own, but here's one I've Here's one I made earlier. Here's one I've been doing for a while now. Um, now, one thing I just will say, Andy, if you're watching this, when it comes to restringing, um, with the adjustable nut, because it's it's loose, that top part is loose, what I uh, advise you do is when you take the strings off, take the outsides out off first and leave, make sure that the last to come off are the middle two. And when you're Restringing, make sure the middle two are the first to go on, um, and that just prevents the in, the adjustable insert from flying around the room. Um, <laughs> I looked at the video yesterday, by the way, of uh, taking the nut off this guitar, and um, I st stopped it and grabbed a frame at the point where the nut pinged off, um, and you can see it's sort of blurred flying across the room, unfortunately. But okay, so I sort of split the thing off into sides. I'm going to do the D and the G first. So the D first, just to hold this down, get it onto there. And then I tend to pull back a fret's worth and wind on from there. 
and then I go I hold the held string goes over the loose string the first time round, and then as the loose string comes around I pull it up and keeping everything under tension I direct the held string underneath the loose string as it comes around and that gives me a nice locking sort of thing going on there I also want to line up my post holes before I start just to make things a bit easier um, yeah so I've got to make a, a, a eight no an SSS Trekkie guitar now in a way it's really nice because I'm on fam familiar terrain making Trekkies having made about nine of them now well that will be the ninth one actually um, and uh, you know really really nice to, to know know what you're doing and actually I've kind of looked at the I looked at the changes in some of them along the way and I'm gonna, I'm gonna sort of go backwards a little bit in the carve structure on this next one and the earlier ones like the one I've kept as a uh, prototype um, has a, a, a less extreme carve um, and less of a sort of knurled edge so it doesn't it's not so extreme and it, as a result it looks it looks just gentler and a little bit more a little less fussy and a little bit more organic ish so that's what i'll aim to do so it just means um starting out by making the drop uh, smaller which means taking care of the thickness down the piece to the, to the right start point i think um, it's going to be a little bit interesting for me because i've got um at the moment, uh, unless I can go and find, I think there might be an, an, one more piece of Eki down at Rod's workshop where I was going to use it for something. But if I if I can't if I can find that piece, then I've got the three pieces I need for the guitar top. If I can't find that piece, I'm going to have to use some thicker stuff, which is also you know the last bits of my collection or my stores, um, which is okay. But that that's actually too thick. To start with so it's about 29 mils or something 28 mils thick to begin with which means i'm going to end up losing 10 at least um, before you know i only want about 14 mils thick top for this unless well yeah to keep it to keep it so i'm not i'm not cutting too much or making too deep a carve um but anyway so that's going to be fun and it's going to be an SSS um, the pickups for it arrived today actually and there's some special American hand wound ones that uh, Beach has found from some supplier um, and I haven't heard them before so I'm kind of looking forward to seeing what they're like um, but I've been playing mine a lot and mine's the mine's number one the, the uh, what do you call it prototype and it's a bit of a yeah a bit of a kind of made it up as I went along because it, it's it's interesting in that it features a single coil in the neck Telecaster single coil and uh, it has a dummy single coil in the middle which is a hum cancellor for the neck single coil so as a result you can turn the neck single coil up really high without any problems so I quite like that aspect of it. Um, there we go. So there's my set of strings fitted and trimmed. Um, now I'm just going to do some, some initial stretching to get them seated on properly. Now this is this stretching out the strings part is really important, um, and I never learned this in all my years playing because nobody ever explained it to me and made it sink in so what I didn't know when I was just doing my thing I didn't know that I didn't know the components if you like of tuning stability okay now that needs to be dialed up yeah so I I, I didn't realize or I didn't know that, that the primary components of tuning stability are not the tuners I mean they're it's actually all down to the unreleased slack in your strings and um, the condition of your nut slot 
Now I didn't know that to begin with, so I didn't pay it any attention. Um, and then I finally learned that it's all really about getting your nut slots right, which is why I kind of gravitated pretty quickly to Tusk, um, having struggled along with bone and stuff for quite some time. But I settled with Tusk because it really is the best um, lubricated material with its PTFE. Um, and I used the adjustable so I don't have to cut down the slots on the guitar, on the nut. Crazy low. Right, these are a little bit high now because we've reduced the action substantially, or well, quite a bit. So we'll just take these down a little bit to about three millimeters. Maybe these are bottoming out, actually. I think they might just be. Incredibly low action. Right, so the key to the stretching business is to put the guitar on the table and physically stretch each of the strings with a thumb and forefinger stretching. And ideally all the way along behind the nut, behind the saddle if you can without breaking it. Um, behind the nut if you can, get it a little bit stretched out. And really the secret is to just do it until doing it doesn't detune it anymore. And there will come a point where that happens and that will be the point at which you can get on and play. Um, if, if you don't do that, it's amazing how much of the slack will eventually um, eke its way out every time you bend a, or bend a, yeah, bend a note basically, or try and tune, the slack will be um, finding its way out. And it can, it only needs the tiniest amount to keep on doing it for years to come. Now, doing this you sometimes will break a string, there's no doubt about it. Um, I try not to, not so much on tens, but if you're doing nines, it's quite easy to break the nine. And if you're doing eights, you can kind of almost guarantee it. And so I tend to ease off on eights um, because I can't afford a whole new set of strings on the odd occasion that an eight E breaks. Anyway, so the idea is you just continue to do this um, until it doesn't detune anymore. And then once you're there, you're there and you can get playing. But we, after this, we've still got to intonate. Then once you're there, oh, it's blindingly low. I want to do some bends. And then 
try again. Wow, that is very, very low. Let me just double check to make sure we're not starting out too low because that's quite often the case um, and there's no real benefit from doing that. Uh, uh, see, that's a little bit of adjustment in cleaning it and doing things. Um, the posts sometimes go down a little bit as they have here. So we are, um, we are under 1.5. So yeah, I don't want to, I don't want to go to silly, silly levels, and that's just under one. So, a little tiny bit of adjustment that's happened along the way. So let's just get it to ideally where we want it, rather than start too low. Okay, next bit, next and final bit is the intonation part. And this is a matter of distance. Um, we, we, we're basically calculating or measuring distance by means of um, using a note. Um, so each string has to have its exact playing length. Uh, because of the differences in composition and thickness of the string, or makeup of the string, each one needs to be just slightly different. And so that's what our bridge allows us to set is the difference between them. So basically we go to the harmonic E of 12th fret. Good. That's it. So there we are. Each one now is exactly the right length um, for this guitar and for the strings that are on it to play. So it's quite cute that we use the tuner to adjust the length. Um, so when we ping the harmonic, 12th fret harmonic, the 12th fretted note should be the same note as that harmonic, that true harmonic. Um, if, it's, if it's sharp, it means the string is too short and we have to pull the saddle back. If it's flat, it's too long, we push the saddle towards the nut a little bit until the fretted note of the 12th is exactly the same as the pinged harmonic of the 12th. And once that's there, we're done. We know it's the right length and each one will be slightly different. And you'll see typically that you'll get a pattern of two lots of three uh, on any guitar with three plain and three wound strings. So that's your typical intonation pattern and my advice is uh, if you see something else happening so you get shortest next next come forward on the d and then back again and you'll see two groups of three staggered like that and if you uh, that's if you've got three plain and three wound if you've got two plain and four wound this one here instead of being back there will be forward of this one Okay, that will be its normal pattern. Um, 
and if, you, if you've got three plane and three wand and you put them on and intonate them and you find that one of them is way off, completely out of sequence, my advice is don't struggle trying to intonate it, throw it away straight away because usually it's that string that's the problem. And I didn't trust this to begin with or, or I, when I figured it out, I, was, I couldn't, didn't quite trust it. I was thinking that can't be the case. Um, but it turned out that was exactly the case. And ever since then, I have, if I've come across that situation, I throw it away, throw the errant string away, and um, lo and behold, it fixes it. And we have, um, we get back into the correct sequence. So here we are, the SC Custom, a bit of extra work, unfortunately, to get the nut right, or get the finish behind the nut right after it split, thankfully. Uh, it's possible to do, although it takes a, quite a bit of work to do. Um, so it's done, playing beautifully. We'll stay in tune now um, and it will be very good to play. Thank you Tunematic um, Bridge. In this case you didn't mess me around by forcing me to reverse any of these. Um, this this uh, pot here was scraping against the ground to begin with. It's still not perfect. Um, you have to lift it quite a way off. It will come up and down there's no real way around it, um, so you just need to uh, pull it up. And if it goes back down grinding, you just need to pull it up a little bit and then you can feel that it's free. It's just a physical thing. It, it's nothing holding it, it just slides up and down the post. We changed the um, that out for a stiffer one um, and that's all good. Uh, what will also go in this bag with the spare parts is the little hex key that goes with the adjustable nut and those Little grub screws are below the surface, so they're not in the way of anything. That's, that's great. What I will do is I'll just tag these to the back of here with some green tape. Oh, sorry, got them. I know where they are when I come to put it back in its box. Sort of, sort of like that -ish. Okay, right. That's it, thank you for watching. We'll get on next time on uh, Andy's Guitars. We'll be doing the Epiphone Broadway Semi-Acoustic Beauty. It'll be nice to get into that. So thank you for watching. See you soon, time to tidy up. Bye.